Okay. Today we will be continuing where we left off last week, reading the Books of Sorrow, which were released uh, back in 2015, a good eight years ago. Um, if you haven't watched last reading session, um, there's a YouTube uh, video up that you can go back and watch. Or to give a super quick recap, we meet three individuals of the Krill race, and specifically of the Osmium Court living on the planet of Fundament. Their father is currently, or was currently, um, acting strangely, having weird conversations with a seemingly inanimate worm familiar, and um, subsequently the the king's regent or the, the king's advisor who specifically stages a coup uh, against the king forcing our three princess uh, or princesses to flee at the time taking the worm familiar with them and the worm familiar speaks to Sathona one of the three krill and tempts Sathona to dive into the depths of their planet Fundament, because Fundament is kind of a gas giant. They do, and down there in the deep, they find power, they grow strong, they practice the sword logic, which says that the right to exist is the only good or benevolent thing, and you worship good by killing other things, thus showing your right to exist. Thus it went for many ages, and uh, they, they killed and killed and killed and killed and grew stronger. And where we start now, I think we are kind of about the peak uh, of uh, Oryx's power, uh, whom Oryx was one of the child forms, uh, or Oryx, uh, one of the one of the children of the Krill that we followed from the start, and eventually turned into Oryx. But I think that's all the background we need, so let's get into it. Verse four zero, a golden amputation. Wrath, behold the wrath of Oryx, coiled for ten thousand years. Behold the golden amputation, the fall of Taishibeth, the end of an age. We beat the worlds of Taishibeth like skull drums, and we howl in joy for our war black, black war moons as they ram silver orbitals and gleaming star webs where infant Taishibethi sun ravens curl and die unborn. In his throne world, Oryx paces ten times. On the first pace, Kraghul sends the accursed blight to the Taishibathi worlds. On the second pace, the Tai unleash their battle fleets and arsenal ships to fight our moons. On the third pace, Oryx's war priest meets them in battle, and he is victorious. He paints the void with fire, he salts the earth with ash. On the fourth pace, Mengor and Kraadug, dyad knights, go to the Raven Bridge, and they stand on it and kill the Tai for ten years. On the fifth pace, the Tai Emperor Raven comes home to her bridge, and she cuts a moon with her talons, she cuts it open and kills its brood. On the sixth pace, Oryx speaks, saying, Listen to me, Emperor Raven and I will describe to you the last true shape which is written on my tablet. And he puts out his fist, full of black fire, and he swallows up the Emperor Raven with a wound. Ayat, only Oryx knows this power, the power to take. On the seventh pace, the perfect Raven comes out of Oryx's wound, and sh she spreads her wings across Taishibeth. Never again is a Taishibethi child born, she is perfect. She enacts the will of Oryx. 
on the eighth pace, the Thai say, Listen, you are spoilers. You are sphincters and excreta. You rot. Why do you kill? We made silver orbitals and golden star webs. We hatched eggs. We had a good thing. Our clothes were nice. Our food was famous. With one of her feathers, our emperor could have tickled the gods. On the ninth pace, Oryx says, This is the only god. This ability to dictate what will and will not exist. This power to go on existing. This is your god. It is never ticklish. On the tenth pace, the Taishi Bethi are extinct. Then Oryx says, Listen, my siblings, do you know what we have done? We have conquered our way to the edge of the deep. It whispers to me when I call on it, and it guides my flight. It says that we are at its threshold, and that I should come inside. I will go and speak to it. Verse 4 1 Battle Made Waves. Oryx went down to his throne world. He went out into the abyss, and with each step he read one of his tablets, so that they became like stones beneath his feet. He went out and he created an altar, and he prepared an unborn ogre. He called on the deep, saying, I can see you in the sky. You are the waves which are battles, and the battles are the waves. Come into this vessel I have prepared for you. And it arrived, the deep itself. Verse 4-2. Majestic. Majestic. Oryx, my king, my friend, kick back, relax, shrug off that armor, set down that blade, roll your burdened shoulders and let down your guard. This is a place of life, a place of peace. Out in the world, we ask a simple, true question. A question like, can I kill you? Can I rip your world apart? Tell me the truth. For if I don't ask, someone will ask it of me. And they call us evil. Evil. Evil means socially maladaptive. We are adaptiveness itself. Ah, Oryx, how do we explain it to them? The world is not built on the laws they love, not on friendship, but on mutual interest, not on peace, but on victory by any means. The universe is run by extinction, by extermination, by gamma ray bursts burning up a thousand garden worlds, by howling singularities eating up infant suns. And if life is to live, if anything is to survive through the end of all things, it will not live. It will live not by the smile, but by the sword. Not in a soft place, but in the hard hell. Not in the rotting bog of artificial paradise, but in the cold, hard, self-verifying truth of that one ultimate arbiter, the only judge. The power that is its own metric and its own source. Existence at any cost. Strip away the lies and the truces and the laying tactics they call civilization. And this is what remains. This beautiful shape. The fate of everything is made like this. In the collision, the test of one praxis against another. This is how the world changes. One way meets a second way, and they discharge their weapons, they exchange their words and markets, they contest, and in doing so, they petition each other for the right to go on being something instead of nothing. This is the universe figuring out what it should be in the end, and it is majestic. Majestic. It is the only thing that can be true in and of itself. And it is what I am. Verse 4 3. When do monsters have dreams? I'm walking down the road. I'm going to the orrery to talk to my dad. 
and I hear, well, I hear there's noise. So I look back, and my sisters are behind me, and they're ripping up the road. They've got these huge swords, execution swords, and they're levering the stones out of the road. The stones are covered in writing. They're like tablets, and there's dirt underneath full of worms. I need to get to the orrery before they catch up to me. So I start running, but right away someone trips me. It's my dad. He's got his foot out, and he grabs me by the horns, and he just slams me down on my face. I'm in so much pain, I nearly throw up a worm. Why weren't you ready for this? Dad says. He's wearing glare goggles. Those shiny goggles that he would use to save his vision during lightning storms or sea fire. All three of his eyes reflect me. Didn't you know they'd be jealous? Because they couldn't come to the orrery and talk to you? Didn't you know they would move against you? I start wailing like I'm two days old again, and I say, Dad, I thought you were my friend. I, I'm supposed to be safe here. But he just puts out his fist, and I realize he's laughing at me for believing him. Why did I think I'd be safe? In his fist, he's got a black sun, and he holds me by the throat and goes to tip the black sun inside me. I can see my jaws and his goggles, three reflections of my jaws with so many teeth. So I start eating my dad. I bite huge pieces out of him and I claw him up. I eat his legs and I eat his arms and I eat his goggles and his eyes. And he says, good, good, this is majestic and true. But my sisters are still tearing off the road, so I don't know how to get back. Verse 4-4, four, four, more beautiful to know. Sometimes I wonder if I'm a nihilist. I don't do much except break things. That's what they say about me. I could have had a great civilization if it weren't for that damn oryx, that damn hive. They don't believe in anything but death. The only way to make something good is to make something that can't be broken. And the only way to do that is to try to break everything. I'm glad I learned that the universe runs on death. It's more beautiful to know, but I am lost somewhere strange. I think that Savathun and Zivu Arath are trying to steal the tablets from me. They must have cut off my tribute while I was away communing with the deep. I love them so dearly. No one else is clever or strong enough to try to break me. No one else can give me this gift. Once, long ago, I killed Zivu Arath on her war moon and she blew up the whole moon to kill me with her. She was laughing in joy. I laughed too. A whole moon. A whole moon. It was a waste of a moon, but it taught me how to save myself from exploding worlds, which was necessary to fight the Yakumin. I love mighty Zivu more than a moon loves the tide. I'll kill her for this. Over and over, forever and ever. When I get home from my wanderings in the deep, and I take back my throne. I'm going to have children. That's what I need. Sons and daughters to love and kill. Verse 4-5 This love has war. Zivu upon Oryx. Uttered by Zivu Arath, sibling of Oryx. Betrayal. We have marooned Oryx within the deep. This is our obligation as lords of the hive, to make war upon each other, to eradicate weakness and make ourselves sharp. Obligations. Once, I permitted Oryx to kill me so that he could gain the sword logic and overcome Akka, our god. This left me trapped deep in my throne. But Oryx, my brother, made war upon the Ekumin, and in that war he described me, for I too am war. Thus I was resurrected. Resurrection. Savathun and I conspired to strand Oryx on his expedition, but I secretly believe that I will be stronger with Oryx to war against. Thus, I describe him. A description of Oryx. When Oryx looks upon you, you feel that you may vanish if he looks away. The crest of Oryx's skull is as long as an arm. In the course of its life, a thought moves from one end to the other. Upon his crest I have painted a line in my blood, so that he will remember me. Each of Oryx's fangs has the precision of a finger and the acuity of an eye. Although he was born at the bottom of the universe and taught to borrow, Oryx has grown wings. 
the light of wildfire shines through them. Oryx teaches, but he will not be taught. Oryx's body is corded with strength. His sinews and his muscles are as strong as his children, and his children are the strength of him. Oryx wears a raiment of worm silk, made from the call of gods. The voice of Oryx may cause two different numbers to become equal. Oryx, my brother, is the bravest thing I know. Upon fundament he learned that we were the natural prey of the universe, the most frail and desperate of things. He thought about this carefully, and he found a way to fix it. He made us strong. He will lead us into eternity. Oryx, my brother, loves me, and this love is war. Verse 4, 6. Eater of Hope You are Crota, my son. Welcome. I fought my way out of hell to make you. I fought my traitor siblings, and I fought the swarming corpse of Akka, and I cut my way back into my own court the high war which had been usurped. Once I had made war on Savathun, and crippled her tribute that she could never challenge me, and once I had tricked Zivu Arath, and poisoned her tribute so that she could never again try to take my tablets, and once I had arranged my own lineages so that I would be greatest among the hive and secure on my throne. Then I found a mother to make spawn. One of those spawn was you. Your life will be a battle too. You will have to win your place at the high war. I will give you nothing except this, your first sword, and this name I have prepared for you. We fight a war against false hope, Crota. We chase a god called the Traveller, a huckster god who baits young life into building houses for it. These houses are unsafe, for they cannot stand against my hive. And these houses are a trap, for they lead young life away from the blade and the tooth, which are the tools of survival and the means of ascension. Only when the traveller is extinguished will the, will, will the universe be free to arrange itself, and assume by ruthless contest its final, perfect shape, a shape which depends on nothing but itself. Thus I name you Crota, Eater of Hope. There is an oath upon me, Crota, my son, an oath against the wretched Teos. This I do not give to you. It is for me, your father, to bear. Let's go meet your aunts and uncles. Verse 4-7. Shapes. Points. Look at you. Already you are grown, my daughter. Already you are a wizard. How I, have I been away so long? Now you are Ir Anuk, and Savathun cackles and rages at your brilliance. You have written eleven axioms describing the ascendant places our throne world. You have announced that you will kill one of these axioms as Akka would kill the truth, and in mantling Akka you will become a god as I am. If you try it, I may kill you, or I may applaud. Well done, I brought you this bitter acid for your celebrations. And you, Irhalak, you are a wizard too, as is the way of twins. I have been with Zivu Arath, who complains that you have made a song, and sung it in her throne world, and killed everyone who listened, quite irrevocably. Will we have songs instead of swords and boomers? What have you made for me? It is a tooth shaped like death. I will keep it in my mouth. What have you written for me? It is the course of the Nietzsche thought ship. I will track it down. I made you by cutting one larvae in half. It would not die. Each half grew into one of you. My sword is named Wolbreaker, but it never broke you. Verse 4-8. The Partition of Death One day Oryx decided to grow new wings. While he wrestled with his worm, he came upon his twin daughters dying in a wound between places. What are you doing, my daughters? he asked. He was afraid that Irhalak and Iranuk were trying to go into the deep, where only the tablets of ruin allowed Oryx to go. We are dying, father, they said, as many times as we can manage. That's adorably precious, Oryx. That's adorably precocious, Oryx shook out his new wings. But why? We propose a method by which ascendant souls can be detached 
and integrated into a tautological and autonomous thanatosphere, which we tentatively ter term an oversoul. Oversouls can be stored in the throne world as a mechanism of enhanced death resilience. As a side effect, mere refinements to our death song may be achieved, moving us closer to a generally effective paracausal death impulse. Oryx brandished his sword. Speak the royal tongue, or I'll pin you up for ear to eat. If we can separate our deaths from ourselves and hide them, we will be hard to kill. Oryx went to his son, Crota. Go, keep an eye on your sisters, he said. You can learn cunning from them. But while Oryx travelled to observe the deep destroy an ancient fortress world, Crota conspired with his sisters to learn their secrets. I, too, will experiment with a wound, he said. With his sword, Crota cut open a new wound into a new space. In here, he thought he might obtain a secret power. Out of this wound came machines called Vex. They invaded Oryx's throne world. Verse 4-9. Open your eye. Go into it. The Vex clattered around, constructing large problems. At first, their constructions were deranged, because they didn't understand the sword logic which defined all rules in Oryx's throne world. The geometry perplexed them. I'll cut them apart, Crota said. But just then, the vex ritual of better thoughts manifested a mind called Coria, blade transformed. Coria deduced the sword logic. I have to kill everything, Coria resolved. Then I will be powerful. Crota's gate began to emit warrior vex, huge and brassy. He leapt forward to fight them, but they blinked away. After they fled from Crota, they killed 2,000 of Oryx's acolytes and 10,000 of his thralls. Soon they had established themselves as powers in this world by right of slaughter. Come forth, sister wizards called Irhalak. We need you. Ir Anuk pulled a sword star out of the sky. Together the wizards, wizards charged it with killing power and made an annihilator totem, which they used to smash the Vex. Close the wound, brother Crota, Anuk ordered. We will find a cunning way to destroy them, but only after they stop constructing problems on us. But Coria had instant its instanced itself to the other side of the gate, and built a holdfast to keep the way open. Coria's objective was to exploit the paracausal physics of Oryx's throne to become divine. It organized a series of test invasions. For a hundred years of local time, the siblings fought the Vex. When the Vex came into the sword world, they were inevitably annihilated. But when the Hive went into the Vex world, they lost too much of their power to win. Father is going to eat our souls, Halak sighed. Korea captured some worm larvae and began experimenting with them. Soon, Korea blade transform manifested religious tactics. By directing worship at the worms, Korea learned it could alter reality with mild antipathogenic effects. Being an efficient machine, Korea manufactured a priesthood and ordered all its subminds to believe in worship. Then it set about abducting and killing dangerous organisms so it could boot up itself to hive godhood. For some re vex reason, Korea never attempted to introduce worm larvae into its mind fluid. Savathun was laughing because she had tricked Crota into cutting that place. This drew the attention of the worm, our god. Oryx, called ear, set your house in order. Verse 4.10, an emperor for all outcomes. Oryx rushed home and read from the tablets of ruin. He put some of the vex into wounds to be taken by the power of the deep. Thus, he turned the Vex against each other. Curia manifested a range of tactics, but none of them were adaptive. Oryx crushed all the Vex in his throne. Oryx thought that he should study geometry like the Vex. It was a map of perfect shapes, but first he had to punish imperfection. My son, he said, this is your punishment. 
come home glorious or die forgotten. He picked up Crota by the legs and threw him into the Vex gate network. Crota battled through history, becoming a legendary demon. In his early centuries, he often spared a few victims to hear oaths and protests against his father. Later, he came to understand Oryx, and he made temples and monuments wherever he went. Meanwhile, Oryx brooded on the Vex. I've met a worthy rival, he said. They want to exist forever, just as I do. But I don't understand them. At this, his worm began to chew on him, for he was bound to understand. He called Savathun to meet in the material world. She told him that the Vex worked tirelessly to understand everything, so that they could build a victory condition for every possible end state of the universe. Then I must be a better king, Oryx said. If they want to build an emperor for all outcomes, then I will be the king of only one. I will follow the deep wherever it goes and document its power. Let us create a catalogue of the grave of worlds, which will be our map to victory. Oryx knew that all life could be described as cellular automata, except for that life which understood the deep or the sky, and thus escaped causality. Out of love for her brother, which was the same as the desire to kill him, Savathun leaked a secret to Zivu Arath. Listen, Zivu, Oryx's throne world has been compromised. You can cut your way in from here. Zivu Arath used this plan to plan an ambush. But Oryx was too canny. The pagan king said to his court, the high war, My throne world is vulnerable. I am going to move it. Where? asked Kagur, world render. Into a mighty dreadnought, said Oryx. I shall keep my glorious mind cosmos inside a titanic worship. Verse 411 Dreadnought. To make his ship, Oryx scrimshawed one piece of Akka, who was dead but far from gone. He stole the hammer of Zivu Arath and the scalpel of Savathun, and he armoured his ship in baneful armour. When Oryx had built his dreadnought, he pushed his throne world inside out, so that it bled into the material space of the dreadnought. They were coterminous and allied, his ship and his sin. The Dreadnought was within the throne of Oryx, but the throne of Oryx was the Dreadnought. I out. This required a verse from the Tablets of Ruin. The whole court worked together to push Oryx's throne inside out. This was a day of joyous violence, and all of Oryx's broods marked this holiday as Eversion Day, which is celebrated by turning things inside out. Saith Oryx, go out into the universe, my court. Gather tribute for me. Send it home to my ship. When I call you, walk up that tribute to my court. I will prepare for long voyages. I and Savathun, insidious. Into the war, I graffiti this notice for you. Into the deep, these books are full of lies. Now Oryx's throne was safe from incursion because it moved so nimbly. Oryx attacked the harmonious flotilla Invincible, who guarded the Nietzsche thought ship. When the flotilla surrounded his dreadnought, Oryx put his sword into the hull, and he used the power of the deep and the clever systems his daughters built to push his throne world out into mere reality. By wrath and confidence, he filled space with an egg of his throne. It swelled up like a ghost star to smash the harmonious flotilla Invincible. Oryx broke the last word off their name. In the Nietzsche thought ship, Oryx hoped to find the location of the gift mast, which had been left behind by the traveller. Oryx wanted to eat it. But the thought ship was a trap. Upon it was Coria, blade transformed. Verse 5 0. Interdict, simulate, worship. I am going to kill you. I am going to salt my meat with your briny little thoughts. I am going to cook flesh on your broken, molten hull. Insinuate. Subvert. Replicate. This ship is my throne. You want to take it from me. 
you want to fill it up with your own spawn and use it for your abstract purposes. But I defy you. Observe. Imitate. Usurp. You will never be what I am. Simulate me, wretch. Calculate the permutations of my divinity. Compute the death and the shape of my throne. Render my shadow on the stone of ten thousand graveyard worlds. It will never be enough. I hold the tablets of ruin. I speak to the deep. Not for the galaxy of thinking matter could you encompass me. Behold. Unknown. Enigma. Shortfall. Abort. Halt. Abort. Verse. Five. One. End of failed timeline. By now, Korea knows it can't win. There's something pathological about the world inside Oryx's ship. It resists analysis with hot, dead spite. And Oryx himself, he's irreducible. He refuses to obey Korea's simulations. He crashes around, sowing chaos. He grabs submines and compromises them with some kind of ontological weapon. Paracausal systems, very problematic. Cory is trying the religious tactics that evolved in the Hive Manifold, but even on those terms, Oryx is strong, so strong, Coria won't be able to protect its gates much longer. The closest Cory has got to a simulation of Oryx is a best guess bootstrap. It's wrong, Cory is sure of that. It's Oryx minus the symbiote organism, minus the wings and the morphs, minus the weapon, minus the power. No good for anything. Coria manifests that simulation anyway, just to see what happens. The Taken King marches on Coria's Hydra Hall, armed with blade and magic, cloaked in ancient cloth, and the universe wails in horror around him. Coria's physics models and toy world choke and crash. Coria observes, alert and attentive, as a single quark splits on the tip of Oryx's sword. From within the Hydra Hall, Coria's tiny, not Oryx, speaks. What are you? it says. It's manifesting terror and awe. Oryx's eyes blaze with a curiosity that is entirely isomorphic with hate, with voracious hunger. Orash, he says in this hive language. You have made me as I was. You have made a tiny orash. Ha! Huh. Korea updates the simulation's name. Orash is curious. You're me? You're me as I become? Oryx kneels. His blade is on his left shoulder. Korea is firing every available weapon at him, but his wards don't break. He looks into Korea's sensors through the hammering fire and he says, Child, I have everything you wanted. I am immortal. I know the great secrets of the universe. I have scouted the edges of the darkness, and I have chased the lying god down galactic arms and a howling pack of moons. In my fist, I carry the secret power that will rule eternity. In my worm, I bear the tribute of my court and of my children, the hope eater, the weaver, and the unraveler. And with this tribute, I smash my foes. I am Oryx, the Taken King. I am Almighty. Korea samples the Teox intelligence retrieved from the Ecumen Gate. These are useful names. It feeds them to the simulation. What about your sisters? Orash asks his future self. Sathona, Shiro, are they with you? The Taken King's fangs glint. That sound might be a laugh. Or a hiss. Coria shuts down its weapons and puts all its spare resources into sending telemetry to the greater Vex. There will be points in space and time where this data is vital. There will be great projects undertaken in the study of this ontological power, this throne space. Where are my sisters? Orash shouts. What have you done with my people? What have you done? But Oryx's fist is full of black fire, and the next thing Coria sees is a light like stars. Verse 5 2 Strict Truth Eternal. I have a gift for you, says Oryx. Savathun, 
Witch Queen looks at him with dry weariness. Is it the sort of logic I need to go into the deep and take your power for myself? Their echoes move among the war moons, walking together on the hull of a two thousand year old warship. Savathun's fleet has assembled here in preparation for an assault on the gift mast. The deep is headed that way on the trail of its prey, and the hive will be its vanguard. It's a vex I captured. Korea blade transformed. It made an attempt to puncture my throne. I thought you might enjoy studying it. Oryx pauses, digesting. Through the bond of lineage, he can feel Crota killing, worlds and worlds away, and it tastes like sweet fat. Korea contains a vexed attempt to simulate me. It might generate others. You, perhaps, or Zivu Arath. I have left it some will of its own, so it can surprise you. I suppose it'll blow up and kill me, Savathun grouses, or let the machines into my throne, where they'll start turning everything into clocks and glass. If it kills you, then you deserve to die. Oryx says it with a quiet thrill, a happy thrill, because it is good to say the truth. I don't have a strict proof yet, you know. Savathun strokes the void with one long claw, and space-time groans beneath her touch. This thing we believe, that we are liberating the universe by devouring it, that we are cutting out the rot, that we are on course to join the final shape. I haven't found a strict eternal proof. We might yet be wrong. Oryx looks at her, and for a moment, just a moment, he is nostalgic. He is sentimental. He thinks, imagine the years behind us, the things we have done. And yet being old doesn't feel like a scar, does it? It hasn't left me dull. I feel alive, alive with you. And every time I step back into this world from my throne, I feel like I'm two years old again, at the bottom of the universe, looking up. But he says, Sister, it's us. We're the proof. We, the hive. If we last forever, we prove it. And if something more ruthless conquers us, then the proof is sealed. She looks back at him with eyes like hot needles. I like that, she says. That's elegant. Although, of course, she has had this thought before. Verse 5-3. I'd shut them all in cells. Pray and sacrifice. Uttered by Zivu Arath, god of war. Harmony. When the Traveler passed across Harmony, it lied to the orbits of ten worlds. Now they orbit the black hole. The Traveler lied to the accretion disk, so that it would give warm light to these worlds. The Gift Mast. When the Traveler left Harmony, it made a monument out of the black hole's polar jet. In the jet there is a hollow mast which sings in radiance. This is the Gift Mast, and we will devour it. We will eat the sky out of it, and we will snap it like a bone. The Harmony Sting. The Harmony have weaponized their dead star. They can simulate the accretion disk to fire relativistic plasma jets. We will take the Sting. We will use it to burn their worlds. I will grant one temple of tribute to the first ascendant to kill a world. Oryx. I will have the gift mast to feast on. I will have it first. I am Zivu Arath, and all war is my temple. Beware the daughters of Oryx, for they make and unmake with ease. Savathun, the deceitful sister will be distracted by Arcana and the song of the black hole. Treat her broods with contempt. The traveler, we chase it and we will devour it. The deep will rule the cosmos. The dragons, our gods should be ours alone. Their smug freedom is an insult to me. I'd shut them all in cells. Bring them to me. Verse 5 4. The Gift Mast. The Gift Mast. It towers above this star system like a monument to treason. It beams with silver light. It sings a radio lullaby made of soothing lies. In its light live the harmony, and they are now our prey. Now arrives Zivu Arath to the head of her armada. 
She fights the harmony for 50 years with strategies and discipline, but the harmony turned to dragon wishes, and their wishful bishops wrestle Zivu in the ascendant plane. Zivu falls into deadlock. Next arrives Savathun, flanked by her chorus and her celebrant. They trick their way onto Anna Harmony in disguises so that they might vivisect these dragons. The worm, our god, laughs and laughs. For a hundred years, Savathun keeps secret covens among the Harmony. But first of all was Oryx, whose brood grew in secret places in the rubble of the accretion disk. The first navigators sends rocks and commons to crash into the Harmony worlds so that the Harmony fleet will be disarrayed. He sends cedars to infiltrate the Harmony worlds with, its, with his broods. Here, at the center of the fifth book, the hive has grown so mighty that it has made the annihilation of all false life routine. Zivu Arath kills the wishful bishops, and Savathun achieves some secret purpose, and Oryx's court tears down the gift mast. The gift mast. The Harmony people wail in terror, and they throw themselves into the silver lakes of Anna Harmony to drown. Come, saith Oryx, eat of the gift mast, for I am a generous god. Of its pieces I claim only two out of every five. The mast is full of the light of the traveller, it is full of the marrow taste of sky. All who eat of it are filled with the ecstatic certainty that they serve a great and necessary purpose. Then saith Savathun, siblings, listen. We must part ways a while so that we may grow different. She applies her war moons into the black hole. Her throne becomes distant. Saith Zivu Arath, King Oryx, you take up too much space. Your power constrains too many choices. I must go away from you. She flies her war moons away into the night. Her throne is barred shut. Then Oryx was alone. He spent a while in thought, and those thoughts are recorded here. Verse 5-5 five, five. Apocalypse Refrains This is our message to the things that we will kill. A species which believes that a good existence can be invented through games of civilization and through laws of conduct is doomed by that belief. They will die in terror. The lawless and the ruthless will drag them down to die. The universe will erase their monuments. But the one that sets out to understand the one true law and to perform the worship of that law will by that decision gain control over their future. They will gain hope of ascendance and by their ruthlessness they will assist the universe in arriving at its perfect shape. Only by eradicating from ourselves all clemency for the weak can we emulate and become that which endures forever. This is inevitable. The universe offers only one choice, and it is between ruthlessness and extinction. We stand against the fatal lie that a world built on laws of conduct may ever resist the action of the truly free. This is the slavery of the traveller, the crime of creation, in which labour is wasted on the construction of false shapes. If you choose to fight us, fight us with everything you have, with all your laws and games. We will prove our argument thus. Verse 5-6 Ayat, 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 Ayat My son Crota, all is well, Ayat. What is at war is healthy, what is at peace is sick. My son Crota feeds me rich, rich tribute. My lineages are strong, my worm is vast and satiated, and with that security I can spend my time on study and communion with the deep. As I learn more secrets, my power grows. As my power grows, I use it to learn more secrets. I add, let it be thus, because it must. I wonder if my sisters have secrets of their own. If my power exceeds theirs, I may kill them permanently and subsume their thrones. 
but I think they have strength that they hide from me, developed in time of separation. I add, the only meaningful relationship is the attempt to destroy. Savathun asks if I am as much a slave of the deep as my taken. She asks what price I pay for my power. I am not taken. The hive is not the deep. The deep doesn't want everything to be the same. It wants life. Strong life. Life that lives free without the need for a habitat of games to insulate it from reality. When I make my taken, I make them closer to perfect. I heal their wounds and enhance their strengths. This is inherently good. I out. The only right is existence. The only wrong is non-existence. I am Oryx, the first navigator, the taken king. I out. Let me be what I am, because to be anything else would be fatal. Verse 5-7 forever, and a blade. I considered returning to Fundament, learning what became of the God Wave and the Tungsten Monoliths and the Continents, which were all that remained of my people's primal home. But I know what became of all that. It became me. I am the heir of Fundament, the immortal descendant of those ten-year krill. I asked a question. How can we live in the universe long enough to understand it? And I learned the answer, which is written here in this book. I learned that I had to become most ruthless of all. I don't know where the darkness which is the deep came from, nor the traveller that I hunt. But I will learn. I will learn. This is my inheritance, my estate, eternity, Infinity, the whole universe beneath my sword. This is what I rule forever and a blade. Verse 5-8 Worm food What will happen if I die? It suits me to consider this, for I am a great ally of death. My daughters study the quiddity of death my son practices the inhabitation of death, and my great work is, in Ultima, to become synonymous with death, to die and in that dying live, so that, if the universe comes to nothing, then I will be a part of that nothing. Far better to have a savage universe with a happy end than a happy universe with no hope. I have died many times, but these deaths were only temporary. If my echoes are killed, and I am killed in the material world, then I will be driven back to my throne, the Dreadnought. If my court and my throne can be beaten, if I am confronted in my throne, if I am defeated there, then I will die. My work will end. This is the pact to which I am bound, in particular by my study of the Tablets of Ruin and by my use of the power of the Deep. When I call upon that power, I put myself up as the stage stakes in a wager. I gamble with my soul. For I am saying, listen, my gods, I am the mightiest thing there is, and I prove it does. Lately, I have realized how much I depend on Crota and my daughters, and even upon my court. If I lost them, my outlays would exceed my intakes. My tribute would not be enough to feed my worm. But this is proper, for if I lost them, it would be because they were not mighty enough, and then I would be a bad father, a bad king. I must test them and fight with them to keep them strong. This is my Gias. I will go on forever. I will understand everything. There is only one path, and that is the path that you make. But you can make more than one path. Break yourself bars. Make a new shape. Make the shape from its path. Find your cell's bars. Break out of the bars. Find a shape. Make the shape from its path. Eat the light. Eat the path. If I fail, let me be warm food. Verse 5-9. I'll make sure. I have made preparations. If I am defeated, I know it will be 
because my understanding of the universe was incomplete. I failed to anticipate some strategy, some nemesis, perhaps Teox, if she still lives. If I am defeated, I know that I will fall to something mighty, something that craves might, something that loves what I love, which is the deep, a principle and a power, the versatile protean need to adapt and endure, to reach out and shape the universe entirely for that purpose, to mutate and redesign and test and iterate so that it can prevail, can seize existence and hold it, certain that this is everything, that there is nothing to life except living. And it has two faces, it is one shape. One face is the objective, which is obvious. And the other face is that will to sacrifice things and ideas for a single mission. The mission of becoming the shape. A shape that will not relent the utter commitment to survival. To draw the right sword and choose where to cut. To allow this hunger to become your weapon. So I will prepare a book, which is a map to a weapon. And my vanquisher will read that book, seeking the weapon, and they will come to understand me, where I have been and where I was going. And then they will take up my weapon and they will use it. They will use that weapon, which is all that I am. And armed thus with my past and my future and my present, which is a weapon, a weapon that takes whatever is available, a weapon bound to malice, they will mantle me, Oryx, the taken king. They will become me, and I will become them, each of us defeating the other, correcting the other, alloying ourselves into one omnipotent philosophy. Thus, I will live forever. I'll make sure. And that is the end of the Books of Sorrow. The implication at the end there uh, is an in-game one, or related to in-game, where uh, we, the Guardians, were collecting these calcified fragments, these 52 calcified fragments, which together make up the whole book, and we read this book, which does indeed provide us a map to a weapon called the Touch of Malice. And we do indeed make the Touch of Malice and use it. However, we did cleanse the Touch of Malice first and thus avoid mantling Oryx in fullness. So while we use this weapon for which this book was a map, we made sure that Oryx will not live forever. So yeah, that is the Books of Sorrow. I have been talking uh, with some people about this book and comparing it. Obviously, this is the second reading that I am doing now. The first one was the very much more recent and potentially more nuanced and philosophical the Hidden Dossier, which released with Witch Queen um, like six years after the Taken King. And the the kind of sentiment is, of course, that the Books of Sorrow were less mature than the Hidden Dossier and the lore that accompanied the Witch Queen. But that is to be expected, because the Books of Sorrow were really the first published uh, work that covered what we now consider to be Destiny's deep lore. And uh, it, it really set up Oryx as a Greek tragic figure, in a sense. He had the choice to, or it seemed to him that he had the choice to die in the crew or listen to the worms. And he listened to the worms and became this great reaver of worlds, reaver of systems, 
that we in turn eventually killed and ended. It was of course revealed uh, during Witch Queen that dying to the coup or listening to the worms was not in fact the only choice that the Osmium court had and that this was a lie told by the worms to Savathun and onwards from Savathun Sathona to her siblings and that when the traveler came the god wave that the worms uh, predicted would not in fact kill everything and the traveler was in fact there to try to provide life to try to hinder the deep from gaining a foothold with the krill uh, but that's witch queen lore which uh, we might have time to get to at some point uh, for now i'm a bit unsure how to do this in the in the following couple of weeks i kind of have uh, two plans or, or, or i made a, a short list of other destiny books that i might read <laughs> but the short list did turn out to be kind of long uh, but there's kind of three like there's uh three categories that i kind of think of the or four categories that i think of the, the lore books in the first category is the obvious not worth reading like they're just kind of not that good they're mostly filler then there's some uh few lore books that are kind of just delightful to read they are very fun and kind of just brings a personal side out of the of the characters from the game. Then there's the character focused stories uh, of uh, of lore books that really go deep into one or a couple of the characters from from the series, uh, and these are also mostly good. And in the fullness of time, I might try to get along to them, get around to them. But the final category that I think the lore books fall into is the story lore books. These are actually kind of the most numerous. Um, you might also call them like the story and philosophy lore books. Um, that are more like this, uh, the books of sorrow, or more like the hidden dossier. And either forward something uh, in Destiny a uh, contemporary story or really bring to light something from the the, the deep lore. Um, and there are tons and tons of really quite good stories there in addition that also interweave with each other. Uh, for example, there is a series of lore books um, starting with Truth to Power, going on to Unveiling, and I think the Singular Exegete that kind of uh, and, and then ends with uh or ends for now at the hidden dossier where uh, in the hidden dossier they reference both the truth to power lore book and the unveiling lore book in different places the truth to power lore book is a lie told to us by savathun uh, uh, which is uh, disgusting length at the at the end of the hidden dossier and the unveiling is a series of notes from the winnower or the entity of the deep to guardians and in the hidden dossier this is talked about as uh, a letter to uh, senara to a specific guardian i think the quote is something like uh, so if they quote to you from the unveiling if they hate you for your uh, disdain for the violent, uh, then ask them this. Who would you rather sit by at the fire, the gardener or the winnower? Um, that was paraphrase. I, paraphrase, I think I, I watched that quote. Uh, but there's kind of like, there are some of these which uh, build up along with each other. Um, I don't remember exactly the length of all of them, and they might be one or two or some of them even three session uh, readings. Um, but I think that is everything for today. I hope you enjoyed the Books of Sorrow, and I will try to be back next week for more reading. Thank you so much for watching.